the outrageous idea is that our Big Bang is the conformal continuation of somebody else's remote future. Mm. <laughs> so there was an eon prior to ours, and its remote future became our Big Bang. Now you need some equations to describe that sort of thing. And I also, for quite a long time, thought, well, I can go on lecturing about this forever because nobody will ever prove me wrong. <laughs> and then I thought, I've got an idea. I could prove myself wrong. <laughs> Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with Sir Roger Penrose on physics, cosmology, and black holes. Roger is a distinguished pure mathematician, mathematical physicist, and Nobel laureate in physics. The emeritus Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford, Penrose has distinct views on the philosophy of science, physics, cosmology, and mind, which we explore. Closer to Truth is presenting this three-part mini-series with Sir Roger Penrose. This is part two, Penrose's unique approach to fundamental physics, cosmology, and black holes. Roger, welcome. Let's start with your Nobel Prize for, as the committee said, for the discovery that black hole formations is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. Please describe how this discovery came about. Well, it was, the story is a bit longer than just that event. You see, I think it was when I was in Cambridge as a research fellow, um, and this was, in, I think, in my second year, when my friend and colleague Dennis Sharma, from whom I learned an awful lot of physics, um, I think told me that there was a lecture being given at King's College London by David Finkelstein, and he thought I would be interested. So I went with Dennis to this lecture, and this lecture was describing how, well, you see, there was this Schwarzschild solution known from way back. It's the first solution to Einstein's equations that was ever discovered other than flat space. And this solution describes a spherically symmetrical body. But if you imagine that body being squashed down smaller and smaller to a certain scale, something crazy happens, and it what people call it becomes singularity. The equations just go crazy. And this singularity was referred to as the Schwarzschild singularity. Now, in this talk given by David Finkelstein, he described it wasn't a singularity at all, that you could choose appropriate coordinates which extend the picture beyond that, and you could imagine material falling right through this horizon <clears throat> and having their existence inside. Now, um, I remember talking to David afterwards, and we, he claimed that we sort of swapped subjects because he became interested in sort of uh, discrete physics, which I'd been interested in, and I became interested in general relativity. <laughs> and uh, we did sort of swap subjects. But I picked up on his arguments there and began to wonder to myself, you've got rid of this so-called singularity at the Schwarzschild horizon, what we now call the horizon, which is what we call the horizon of a black hole now, at that diameter. And, uh, but yet you still have this singularity in the middle where the curvatures seem to go to infinity and you can't do anything about it. So I did wonder whether there might be a general theorem in mathematics which told you if you have an irregular situation, not a completely symmetrical collapse, because this was all talking about spherical symmetry, everything is the same all the way around, and it's a very special situation. So in a general collapse, you'd expect something complicated going in. And do you still have a theorem which tells you there's a singularity? I don't know why I thought that at the time, but what I did think was, I wonder if there's a theorem. And if there is one, why, doesn't, why don't they know it? Because I would have heard about it. Or David would have explained it to me or something. He would have said there's this theorem. So I claimed, realized there wasn't one. So I thought, well, I wonder whether one could prove something like that. And then I thought, well, what do I know about general relativity that other people might not know? Pretty well nothing, <laughs> because I, I was not an expert in the subject. But what I did know was Dirac's lectures on two-component spinners, which I'd been to. And they were very revealing to me. I won't go into the why I was interested in this sort of thing, but it was a, an opening of a new way of looking at things. And when I applied these ideas to general relativity, 
the thing sort of opened up in a way which was quite different from other ways of looking at the subject. So I, I mention all this because it's background. It wasn't what actually uh, led to the actual theorem and the proof of it, which came many years later. You see, this, this I think it was 1958 when, I, when David Finkelstein gave a talk. And uh, it was much later when people were starting to see these radio signals from what became known as quasars. These were extremely energetic entities, very, very puzzling entities, because from the redshift, they seem to be receding from us at a very, very great speed. And the normal explanation for that would be, oh, well, they're very, very distant. The universe is expanding. So these objects, which we now call quasars, sources of these very strong radio signals, must be very, very distant because of this redshift. And if they're that distant, they must be extremely powerful. And if they're that powerful, they must be involving a large amount of mass, considerable proportion of the mass in a galaxy, or something like that. Yet, they couldn't be that big because the variation in these signals indicate that they couldn't be bigger than the solar system. They have to be much smaller than the solar system. So you have something which looks like a body of the nature of you would get if you could collapse something down to this short, short radius. Now, so I got interested in this. I think it was John Wheeler who was particularly interested in this question. And at that time, there was a paper written by two Russians, Lishitz and Kalatnikov, who seemed to have proved that in the general situation, you didn't get singularities. There were some complicated swishing around as the thing collapses inwards and they become swirling out again in some way like that. I had a look at the paper. I didn't really, I didn't notice the mistake. There was actually a serious error in the paper, which I think was discovered by Belinsky later, who then collaborated with the Russians. But at the time, there was, it was, nothing was wrong with the paper as far as people knew. I just wasn't totally convinced by the methods that they use. So I started to thinking, thinking about this problem and uh, using other kinds of techniques, which for other problems I'd been thinking about before, which was a general arguments about surfaces and future regions of surfaces and what does the boundary of a future look like, what are its properties, and then you get the light rays on the boundary and they start crossing over and producing horrible caustics and crossing regions and things like that. But I could realize how you could circumvent all these problems originally for quite a different reason. But then I thought of applying these ideas to the black hole. We didn't call them black holes in those days. That was really John Wheeler, I think, largely who t used that term. But we, they were just collapse, collapsing objects. There was known from 1939 a paper by James Robert Oppenheimer and a student of his, Snyder, but they'd only considered a completely spherically symmetrical cloud of dust. Dust means no pressure. Spherically symmetrical means that everything is falling directly to the center. So the fact that you get this singularity at the center wouldn't surprise anybody because there's nothing to stop the matter. There's no pressure. There's nothing. And so you get the singularity. Very artificial. In general, you don't expect it. They will swish around and do something else, come swirling out. That seemed to be the normal view. But I had been thinking about it using the kinds of methods I'd been worrying about at the time. And I thought of this concept of a trapped surface, which is a way of characterizing when a collapse had reached the point of no return in a certain sense. And I sometimes tell the story of how that came to me when I was crossing a street. There was a, I was being visited by Ivor Robinson, who was a, an Englishman who was working in Dallas, Texas. But he had a wonderful way with words that the Americans absolutely loved. He certainly had a wonderful way with words. And he was talking to him about something, I have no idea what. We came to this road where we crossed the road, conversation stopped, we got to the other end. And when he left, I remember having this strange feeling of elation. What am I feeling elated about? I have no idea. I went through the things that happened to me during the day. What did I have for breakfast? What did I walk from through the woods or, and all these things which happened part of the usual thing? No, nope, no, nope, not that, not that. Crossing the street. Then the silence came and I stopped kind of talking. I had this idea and I was able to resurrect the idea, fortunately, of how to characterize without using any symmetry ideas, 
of a collapse that had gone too far. And then I knew from the kinds of arguments I'd been playing with with other, a lot of things, what boundaries of future look like, and once you have this trapped surface condition, and I sketched out an argument which showed that you had to have a singularity. It was not, I didn't have the best argument. In fact, the argument I used in the paper, I was really embarrassed about this because it wasn't, I had a rather clumsy argument at one point. And Charlie Misner, with whom I uh, shared uh, ex uh, with my years as a research fellow at, at, Prince, uh, at Princeton under John Wheeler, and I learned a lot of physics from Charlie Misner, and he told me a better way of, he'd, he'd already told me this better way, and I knew it already for some stupid reason. I hadn't thought of using it in the argument. But when I described the argument elsewise, I always used the better way. But anyway, that, that was the origin of this paper. What reaction did people have? I think quite typical. I, well, I, I remember visiting Princeton a little while later than this, and Bob Dickey, who was a very distinguished physicist, and he came up to me, slapped me on the back and said, you've done it. You've shown general relativity <laughs> is wrong. And I think this was a common view that people had because you got these singularities. And I have a suspicion that if Einstein had been alive at that time, and I'd sort of had the chance to explain this to Einstein, he would have had a similar view. But that tells you that general relativity is wrong. You shouldn't get singularities. It wasn't quite the view I had. My own view, okay, well, something else has to replace general relativity when curvatures become so strong that you have to bring in quantum gravity. That's probably true, but it doesn't help you very much in this, this kind of situation. But um, that was sort of the origin of the paper. In fact, I gave talks at the conferences. There were these Texas conferences that initially were held every year, I think. And I usually gave a talk about what came to be known as black holes. Was that your 1965 paper, Gravitational Collapse and Space-Time Singularities? Yes, indeed, that was that paper, yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, what kind of mathematics did you use in that paper in your developmental work uh, that analyzed the properties of space-time? Because many give you credit for bringing new mathematics to... Uh, um, to assess and evaluate the nature of space-time. Yes, well, you see, that sort of time, there were two approaches people would have to this kind of problem, or general relativity in general. One of them would be to find exact solutions, and the Schwarzschild solution was one very famous one, and the Kerr solution, another famous example, which describes black holes, um, rotating black holes, um, when they've settled down. But you see, that's not very good when you're looking at a collapse because it's going to be something very complicated. So exact solutions aren't much help. The other kind of techniques that people would have used would have been computer methods. You put the thing on a computer and you chug away. <laughs> well, the computer methods were not very advanced at that time. You wouldn't have been able to get very far at all. Even now, to know whether you're actually getting a singularity or is it just that you overloaded something on the computer. I mean, is it that the computers can't handle curvatures which get so big or something like that? Um, is it really a singularity? It doesn't quite answer the question. I suppose that's probably the way people would have gone without these kinds of techniques. But I developed quite different techniques which were had to do, some people call them topology. They're partly topological. That means you're looking at properties of spaces where you don't not interested in distances and things like that. It isn't quite that. One's looking at, at, at um, you see, it's a kind of geometry which hadn't been much studied mathematically. You see, general relativity uses what people would say Riemannian geometry. Now, it's not quite right, because Riemannian geometry, it certainly is the using the formalism that Riemann had introduced initially, and then the Italian geometers, Levacivita and people like that, had developed these techniques. And fortunately, the techniques were there. So when Einstein developed his theory, he could, uh, well, through his, his uh, colleague, uh, was able to, um, to access this body of understanding. Now, this body of mathematical understanding 
was what we now refer to as Riemannian geometry. Now, Riemannian geometry isn't really quite the kind of geometry which is used in general relativity. Uh, let me try and explain this in a certain way. It's really what you call Minkowskian geometry, except the word Minkowskian is misleading. <laughs> it is due to Minkowski, put it like that. There was this mathematician who got a way of understanding relativity. Now, when I say relativity now, I mean special relativity. That was the relativity theory before gravity is brought into the picture. You have speed of light and how things behave when you get to the speed of light, when you approach the speed of light. And people, even Einstein, tended to talk about this in terms of transforming from one set of observers to another. And the name relativity even comes about because you're thinking of it in that kind of way. Different observers measure different things and they're all relative to each other and the concepts become relative, which is a bit misleading. What Minkowski did was to show, no, it's kind of geometry. It's like Euclidean geometry, but instead of having more pluses, you see in, in Euclidean geometry, if you want to know the distance between two points and you use coordinates, you put the square root of the sum of the squares of all the coordinates. And that's the sort of thing you do to talk about ordinary Euclidean geometry and coordinates. Now, what Minkowski showed is if you change a sign, you have squares, sums of squares. No, you don't. You put some minus signs in. Then you get what we refer to as Minkowski's geometry. Einstein, when he first saw it, thought it was mathematical sophistry and not very important. But he realized later, no, that's the way to look at it. All these ideas of special relativity, they're just a form of geometry. It's a different kind of form of geometry where you have space and time. They're on a sort of equal footing, but there's a sign difference, a plus and a minus. So you use a minus sign rather than a plus sign in some way. I won't go into the details of that, but the time directions have a different sign from the space dimensions. Once you've got that idea, it's not hard to see how to adopt that kind of geometry to this Minkowskian kind of geometry. Now, the term Minkowskian now is a little bit confusing to me here because the term means the flat space that Minkowski actually introduced. When you go beyond that, and that was Einstein's huge re revolution, was to understand you take Minkowski in geometry is the flat space version, and you now bend it. So you have a curved space time. So you're using the ideas of Riemann and Lebesgue and, and these other Italian geometers, and you combine them with the idea of Minkowski. And it's that combining which people didn't take on really. It was confusing to people. If you don't realize, it's not really Riemannian geometry because you've got a difference in the sign. And it's really a different subject. And it's that subject, this is the answer to your question, somewhat complicated answer, I'm afraid. The answer to your question is, is this subject of when you take the geometry, that is the um, Riemannian geometry, which is curved space-time, but you use the notion of distance, where the distance is really a time, and you have these pluses and minuses, and which aren't all the same sign. And once you got used to that, the kind of geometry you're using, or the kind of topology, the kind of geometry, when I say topology, I mean you're not actually looking at exact solutions most of the time. You're looking at general features which these solutions have to have. And you get a feeling for that kind of geometry. And that's what I suppose, I wasn't actually quite the first person to do this. There were a few people, but they hadn't got very far. And I was able to use theorems in this kind of geometry, which hadn't been really explored before in any deep way, to show how you could prove these singularity theorems in general relativity. And it was really a subject which took off from there. Mm. Then a few years later, I think, uh, maybe 1969-ish, you began an association with Stephen Hawking uh, <laughs> in further developing what happens when all black matter collapses into a, a, a singularity, uh, this geometric point in space where mass is theoretically compressed to an infinite a, a density and uh, zero volume, which sounds you know very difficult to conceive of. Um, how did that process begin and what, what, was, what was the additive feature? Perhaps I should clarify the history a little bit. Um, according to the movie, you see, I gave a talk at King's College on this collapse theorem, which I just described for black holes. And uh, 
according to the movie, Stephen Hawking was there with sparks coming out of his head or something, being inspired by the talk. <laughs> he wasn't actually there. He was not present. I was very proud of the occasion because John Singh was there, who was a, a an Irish uh, uh, relatively relativist who had two books which were very f- written from a geometrical point of view. And so I really liked his books and I felt very pleased that he was there. But Dennis Sharma heard about my talk. Dennis Sharma was in Cambridge and had his group there and asked um, whether I would give a repeat of my talk at King's College in Cambridge. And Stephen Hawking was there. And not only that, but I gave a private session after the talk that I gave to Stephen and George Ellis, possibly Brandon Carter. I don't think he, I'm not sure he was there, but certainly George Ellis was there. And he and Stephen had been working on certain theorems, but they realized that these techniques that I'd been using were, were something they could go off on a different tack altogether. Stephen very pick, quickly picked up on the arguments I was using and applied them to a cosmological situation in a rather limited sense, but it was a good argument. And he then sort of took on it, took off on his own and developed these techniques. At that time, I was interested in other things. I kept in contact with Stephen, but I didn't uh, do much with him, except towards the end, <laughs> there was a series of talks that I gave in Seattle. There were John Wheeler and Cecile DeWitt had organized a series of talks there. And I had to give a series of 12 lectures. They got a lot of collection of mathematicians and physicists together. These were called the Battelle Rencontre. And uh, I remember wasting a lot of time on one area. And I'd only left three lectures for my theorems and, and talking about the singularities and black holes and so on. So the first talk I talked about the Schwarzschild singularity case. Then the second talk, so these were the three talks at the end. <laughs> I gave, I think it was, I think, 12 lectures. I can't even remember whether it was 12 or 24. Quite a lot of lectures. And uh, only right at the end did I leave myself enough time to give these three talks. One was on the Schwarzschild solution. One was on my singularity theorem, which I just talked about. And the final one was all on, on Stephen's theorem. She's had several different theorems, published mm. articles in the World Society, and I had to give this talk the next day, and I hadn't left myself enough time, a lot enough time. So what on earth do I do? So I spent most of the night trying to work out one theorem which encompassed all the results that Stephen had, <laughs> which I finally did. I gave this talk, and when I got back to England, I phoned up Stephen. I said, "Look, I've got this new theorem," which I had, and he said, "Yes, so have I." <laughs> so he's actually yeah. found it independently, and then we wrote a paper together, which was the. Two papers was one for the Gravity Prize, which we got second prize. <laughs> the other one was we wrote for the Royal Society. We wrote a long, detailed paper. So that was the only real collaboration we had. Roger, looking back now from the perspective of 2022, a couple of years after your Nobel for this, uh, how has the argument uh, stood up? Uh, and what kind of um, nuances or improvements do you see in our understanding after so many years? Yes, well, as, as I say, Stephen picked up on the cosmology end of the arguments, showing that the singularities were generic also in that situation. However, I get, was always very troubled by the, although you say the singularity in the Big Bang is in the past and the ones in the gravitational collapse, the black holes is in the future, and you just have one way or the other. But when you look at the details of these things, it's extremely different. That is to say, the singularities in black holes were utterly different from the one in the Big Bang. And I don't think people have really, even now, faced up to this. It was a thing that troubled me very greatly. It's all tied up with the second law of thermodynamics, but it almost is the second law of thermodynamics. And I remember giving a talk at Caltech, where um, I think Feynman was there, and I described this big puzzle. You see, when you see the earliest, what's the earliest evidence we see of the Big Bang? There's this thing called the microwave background. You see this radiation coming from the, the Big Bang. So it's the clearest evidence that there was a Big Bang, is the microwave background. But this microwave background, one of the most 
uh, the earliest observation of this thing was that it had this called a Planck spectrum. What that means is that you're looking at the very most random thing you possibly could. So you're looking at photons coming from this very, very early stage, and it's as random as it possibly could be. Now, what does the second law of thermodynamics tell you? It says things get more and more random as time goes on. So when you go to see the earliest thing you've ever seen, and you find that it's the most random thing you've ever seen, how can it get more random? To me, this was a great, great puzzle, um, a fundamental difficulty about the whole situation. You're seeing the most random thing in the universe. People say, oh, well, the universe is expanding. But you think about it a bit more. Well, that's not the answer. It certainly isn't the answer. What is the answer? The answer is that what you're seeing in the microwave background is basically photons and matter in its most random state. There is something else that you're seeing. That is its uniformity over the sky. Now, it's uniformity over the sky. You might say that's also random. As far as matter and radiation is concerned, yes, it is. But how about gravity? Gravity behaves in a very different way. You can think of this in terms of stars and galaxies, and they sort of clump together and they form black holes, and the entropy is going up and up and up and up. So as the thing entropy goes up, as far as gravity is concerned, the thing is getting much less uniform. So the uniformity in the sky is telling you that gravita the gravitational degrees of freedom were simply not activated. So in the very early universe, you have this extraordinary puzzle that whereas everything else was as random as it could be, seemingly, gravity was not. It was not taking part in this randomness. It was aloof from it all. It's very different. You have to have a theory which explains why gravity is so different from everything else in the beginning. And my initial reaction to this was, OK, everything is sort of quantum gravity at the beginning or something like that. But it's got to be a very, very peculiar kind of quantum gravity in which it's very time asymmetrical. The gravitational degrees of freedom, I used to call it what I call the Weyl curvature hypothesis. Weyl, W E Y L, he's a great mathematician who understood the uh, general relativity extremely well. And the fact that the curvature which describes gravity is a particular kind of curvature, it's what's called the conformal curvature or the Weyl curvature. And what you see is that kind of curvature was not activated in the early universe. Now, why was that? If it was just quantum gravity, why isn't that a symmetrical theory in time? So I had this view for quite a long time, which is, OK, yeah, it's quantum gravity, but it's a very, very peculiar kind of quantum gravity. It's nothing like any kind of quantum mechanics we've ever seen. And if you're just trying to quantize gravity, you're not going to get it. So that was a view I had. I still sort of hold that view. But it's not the answer, which I would describe, I think, in a, uh, maybe in a different way. So you, you in essence, are, are challenging the standard model of lambda cold dark model for the uh, origin of the universe. Uh, um, and you propose a, a different uh, solution, conformal cyclic cosmology. Um, how does that work? Uh, what are the fundamental differences between the two and what kind of evidence do you believe supports conformal cyclic co cosmology? It's rather ironic in a way that the term lambda cold dark matter, lambda, lambda CDM, cold dark matter, I'm agreeing with both of those things. That is to say, mm -hmm. lambda is there in the form of a cosmological constant. That would be my view. Other people might have other views about that. There is this thing called the cosmological constant, which seems to be what's causing the exponential expansion we see for the very, very distant things in the universe. Sure, I think that's right. Lambda, I agree with. Cold, dark matter, sure, that's there too. <laughs> but I'm not complaining about the elements of that theory. It's just it seems to take people in what I regard as the wrong direction. Quite understandably, because the point of view that I maintain is outrageous. And in fact, when I used to give talks about it, I always used to call it outrageous. <laughs> Partly as a defense against other people calling it outrageous. I, no, no, I've already said that, you see. But well, as, as, as we say in consciousness, as we say in cosmology, the question is not whether it's outrageous. The question is, is, that, is it at outrageous enough? Exactly. <laughs> That's right, yes. yes. Well, the argument so, is... So, yeah. The argument is that the Big Bang was not the beginning. 
But you have to take a view, which isn't the usual view that people have in general relativity. It's not diff the view is in a, a question of emphasis. But in some sense, the like cones or the null cones are more fundamental than the metric. This means that, if you like, the geometry determined by massless objects or photons, things which don't have any mass, is more basic than the geometry where you have distances and times. One tends to think of distances and times as the metrical structure. But think of that as a secondary notion. And it's quite a useful way of thinking about it because the metric is a quantity which has 10 numbers to define it per point. So at every point of space-time, where you have four dimensions of space-time, at every point you have four numbers which tells you what the metric is. That's the usually an expression which says the S squared equals blah, 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 blah. And it's, that's the metric. And it has 10 numbers to define. Now, nine of those numbers define the just where the light cone is. And when I say nine, I really mean the independent ratios of those 10 numbers. The independent ratios, I don't, I'm not interested in overall scaling. Uh, I'm just interested in the independent ratios of those 10 numbers, which are nine independent ratios. That tells you the light cone or the null cone. It tells you how photons go. So you, they, in space time, you have this cone thing. And you have a history of a photon that goes along these cones. That's the way light behaves. If you have anything else which had no mass, it would just respect those cones. It would not be interested in anything else. When I say anything else, what's the tenth component? The tenth component is determined by mass. And that is two, the two most fundamental equations of 20th century physics. One of them just crept into the 20th century. One of them, of course, is Einstein's E equals MC squared. C is just a constant, so it tells you energy, that's the E, and M, that's the M. Energy and mass are equivalent. Energy and mass are equivalent. That's E equals MC squared. C just tells you the relationship between the two. What did Max Planck tell us earlier than Einstein? He told us E equals H nu, or HF, people. Nu or F is a frequency. H is a just a constant, like it's like C. What's it telling you? Energy and frequency are equivalent. Energy and frequency. Okay, put the two together. Energy and mass are equivalent. Energy and frequency are equivalent. Mass and frequency are equivalent. So if you have a massive body, it is a clock. It has a tick ratio just by virtue of its mass. It's a very high frequency, so you can't directly use the mass of a particle as a clock. But in a sense, people do. They just sort of gear it down by tricky ways of doing it, and you gear it down and you make atomic or nuclear clocks. So that's the origin of the very robust nature of these atomic and nuclear clocks. But it comes down to the fact that mass is where you get the, the one extra thing. The scale comes from mass. Okay, we turn this around. What happens in the very remote future? I'll simplify the picture a bit to say, well, it's pretty well just photons. Most of the particles running around are photons. If it was just photons, you wouldn't have any mass. Photons don't have mass. They don't even know anything apart from the light cones. So you have what's called conformal geometry. You don't have the full 10 components, you have nine. You have the nine which tell you where the null cones are. What about the Big Bang? The story is even actually clearer there. When you get the further into the Big Bang you get, the hotter and hotter the more the particles are racing around at rate rate speed. They have a mass, but the mass contribution is almost entirely through their motion. The mass, the rest mass of those particles, when you get right into the Big Bang, is pretty well irrelevant. They are pretty well massless. So their mass is for a different reason. But at the two ends of the universe, the Big Bang and the remote future, you have the geometry of conformal geometry. It's the geometry where scale has got lost. And so it's not so outrageous to say, and this is where I am being outrageous, but it's not so outrageous <laughs> to say that the Big Bang, stretch it out, the remote future, squash it down. When I say stretch and squash, I'm not affecting the conformal geometry. It's very useful to have those Escher pictures, so-called circle limits, and you can see these fish or these angels and devils 
as they get close to the boundary, they get seem to get smaller and smaller. As far as they're concerned, they're the same size as the ones in the middle. So you can represent infinity. Infinity can be represented as a nice boundary. That's one trick. The other trick is stretching out the Big Bang. That again can be represented as a nice boundary. It was my then student, Paul Todd, who rather suggested, rather than saying the viral curvature is zero, which is meant, I said, which isn't very useful, say that the Big Bang is stretchable out and it can, can be continued. Okay. That's a big constraint on the Big Bang. What happens? He doesn't say it has anything. It's just the beginning, but stretched. I'm saying it's the same as the remote future of a previous eon. So I'm saying that our eon began with our Big Bang, stretched out, so it's a nice smooth surface when you stretch it out. And all the physics gets nice and conformal because the temperature gets so big and you can stretch it out and it makes sense. The remote future, you squash it down. And that makes sense. And the outrageous idea is that our Big Bang is the conformal continuation of somebody else's remote future. So there was an <laughs> eon prior to ours, and its remote future became our Big Bang. Now you need some equations to describe that sort of thing. And I also, for quite a long time, thought, well, I can go on lecturing about this forever because nobody will ever prove me wrong. And then I thought, <laughs> I've got an idea I could prove myself wrong, <laughs> which was signals of a certain type can get across. The main important signals which could get across would be gravitational wave signals. So gravitational waves could, in principle, get across from one eon to the next. Do we see any evidence for such things? Well, that is a long story there, because I... Uh, there were various people who started to look for these things and then you know, got discouraged. My Armenian colleague, Vahe Gurzadjan, um, we got more serious into this. Some Polish colleagues also, headed by Krzysztof Meisner, um, um, Pavel Nirovsky, and then later on, Daniel Ann got involved. And independently, we and they analyzed signals in the microwave background, which seemed to indicate the presence of black hole collisions. So this would be supermassive black holes. You're thinking about galactic clusters. And we know in our galaxy, we have a supermassive black hole. As it time goes on, it will swallow more and more stars in the galaxy. Just different galaxies will collide. Their black holes will congeal. The Andromeda one is much bigger than ours. It'll swallow us out in one gulp take a few thousand million years probably to do it, but never mind, uh, one gulp. But when it does this, there will be a great burst of gravitational waves going out. Those gravitational waves go out and out and out and out. They will meet the crossover surface, go through it, and produce a signal on the other side, which we might possibly see. The argument is that we see them. And this is very controversial. Many people believe you can't possibly see these things. It must be a mistake. <laughs> Very good. We've, we've had this going on forever. The latest paper we have in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society is on a different effect. This is what we call Hawking points. And we see them with a very, very strong signal. Describe the Hawking points. Well, what happens to a galactic cluster? You see, our galactic cluster contains not a very large number of galaxies. They run into each other. Their black holes will congeal, and they'll settle down with one black hole. We'll start gulping down stars, and most of the cluster will get swallowed in one super-duper black hole. There are a lot bigger clusters around, and they will produce black holes. Now, what happens to those black holes? According to Stephen Hawking, and I agree with him, these black holes will radiate energy. They won't, that won't happen for an awful long time because the temperature of the universe as a whole is much bigger than the temperature of the Hawking evaporation. You have to wait till the radiation goes down and down and down and down. You have to wait for something like 10 to the 100 years, the Google years, one followed by 100 zeros numbers of years, something of that sort of order before the black holes start to radiate away the temperature of the universe gets low enough that the black holes have become the hottest things around. Then they evaporate away. 
all that evaporation, and you look at the conformal picture and you see what happens here, it gets, you think it may be spread out for ages and ages over the universe, but in the conformal picture, you think of the Escher angels and devils. They get squashed into a tiny little point. That tiny little point comes through, and you can, there are theorems which tell you that all the energy in that galactic cluster does not get lost. It has to be there in the next eon. So what happens to it? The energy has to be there. It pours through in one tiny little point. What happens to that tiny little point? It spreads out for 380,000 years. The, the photons can't get out. They just scatter as they scatter, 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 until 380,000 years, it gets cold enough that the photons get out. And then you see them. And you see spots in the sky which would have a radius of something like, well, there's some little bit of argument about this, about five to eight times the diameter of the moon. What we actually see is eight times the diameter of the moon. And those we claim are these spots, Hawking points or Hawking spots. The points are the little individual points as they come through. The spots are what you see, which are eight times the diameter of the moon. They are seen with a confidence level of 99.98. So it's very strong signal. Where are they exactly? Well, you can see, pick out the strongest ones, the five strongest ones in the, well, the satellite that we mainly use is the Planck satellite. You go back to the older satellite, the WMAP satellite, and you find those five points are also there at exactly the same places in that other satellite data. There's a sixth one in the WMAP data. Go back, look at the Planck data, it's there too. So I would say those six points are probably genuine Hawking points. Those are at a very challenging position. You've said it, and it's certainly very controversial. Not a lot of people ag agree with the data analysis, but it's it's there for uh, everybody to to evaluate. What I'd like to understand, though, is in that transition where uh, the end of one epoch or a aeon um, then conformally looks the same with with a, with a, a with a scale change to, to go to the Big Bang of the next, uh, what, what is the trigger point for that? Is, is there a, is, is it a, a critical mass of something or what, what is the, the, the event that causes that transition to be made? Well, you see, it's not really an event because it's infinity, if you like, and infinity isn't much of an event. You see, it's, 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 it becomes, the physics becomes, I mean, I think particle physics also has to be accommodated in some way to make it more conformal. I am I, not a particle physicist, so I can't really argue on this. When things get extremely cold, there are certain things which start to look rather like when it's extremely hot. And there are things like conformal theories which start to address these issues. I think particle physics has to be developed to accommodate this. It's not right to call it an event, I think, because okay. it's, it's just that it sort of merges into the other. And the physics becomes not interested in, in the scale anymore. It becomes interested in conformal structure. Yeah. Then, so, so what I'm looking for is, is, is what makes that transition where the physics is not interested in the scale. Yes. That, that's the key phrase. What causes that transition? Well, I think it's two different things. One in the remote future, one in, in the remote, well, near the Big Bang. The remote future has got to be something like mass fade out. You see, I can't say this without being a little technical, but you see there are, in, in particle physics, there's the first thing you ever do, which is to look for the Casimir operators of the Poincaré group. Now that's technical jargon. But the thing is that when you have a cosmological constant, this is this lambda term that in Einstein introduced for the wrong reason. He wanted a static universe, but it seems right. to be there. It seems to be what's causing this exponential expansion. I mean, there may be some other reason for that, which people argue for. I go for the Einstein cosmological constant. But when you have that, your physics really changes. And it's not the Poincaré group anymore. It's the De Sitter group. Now, this makes subtle differences, which people totally ignore when they look at particle physics. But when you see this lambda term is in there, it changes what the fundamental things are in physics. And mass fades out 
as being one of the fundamental things. It's a more subtle thing. And so that mass is allowed not to be a constant. Now, when this becomes important in the remote future, there probably is a time, and probably something like 10 to the 100 years or something, I don't even know. There's probably an earlier time where it's important, where the dark matter, you see, there's a question about dark matter. Dark matter has to be present in this scheme. And we haven't emphasized that much, but the equations don't work unless you have a dark material, which basically is what holds the universe together. And I claim this is the, what dark matter is. And it's a, it's a scalar material, and it has to decay after a certain length of time, probably about 10 to the 11 years, which is a little bit longer than the whole length of time up to now. So it's about 10 times as long as that. So in that kind of length of time, this dark matter will have started, well, that, that's a sort of half-life. That's when half of it will have gone. So it's already started to decay. So, so there's less of it now than there would have been in the very earliest observations of dark matter. So there are lots of observational features which I think people should explore. Do we see evidence for dark matter fading out? It could relate to these curious discrepancies between the measurement of the Hubble constant. There are two mm. quite different values that people come to in the expansion rate of the universe. And this could, different be, mm. this could be the result of a change in the dark matter content. It's only one. Uh, I, I, love, I love your challenging of current belief. Uh, that, that's terrific. Even if it's not right, it, it, it forces us to think hard about what, what our data is and what, the, and what the theories are. Roger, I'd like to conclude with your interpretation of the relationship between quantum mechanics and general relativity, the quest for quantum gravity, which in today's world has some very um, organized schools and string theory, loop quantum gravity, et cetera. Uh, I think you take an orthogonal approach to, to all of it and have, have a very I different <laughs> way of thinking. <laughs> yes. Now, I take a very different view. You see, when people talk about quantum gravity, they tend to mean what happens at very, very, very tiny distances and very, very huge energies. Now, that's a reasonable question. And when you're talking about the singularities in black holes, that's sort of where you're driven. Say, so, OK, the curvatures get bigger and bigger, which means the radius of curvature gets smaller and smaller. And when it comes, that comes down to something like whatever it is, 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the radius of a proton, I don't know exactly the figures, but when you're looking at something like that, do we not have to change our physics and to have a quantum gravity theory? Very likely. I'm not complaining about that. All I'm complaining about it, it's the wrong place to look. When I say it's the wrong place to look, it's because there's a much better place to look than that place. That place to look is not a place where we see any um, positive indication of experimental, well, I mean, maybe there's some wild ideas that people have, but you, you people tend to talk in terms of accelerators were so, so enormous that they'd have to be the size of the solar system or something like that. You can't have it with present day accelerators to get to anything like the energy that you would need here. Okay, that may be true, it may be whatever, but it's not interesting. And, and that's where all the string theorists are going and so on. I liked string theory when I first heard about it because I thought the idea was a, a pretty one. What I didn't like is when people then got driven off to consider, first of all, 26 dimensional space time and then 10 and then 26 and 10 at the same time or 11 and various things like that, which all seemed to me going in the wrong direction. We've got four dimensions and we have to understand those four dimensions. To, to curl them up into tiny little balls is not an answer, and it has a lot of problems. And I don't think any of these problems have been faced up to properly. So therefore, wh what direction would you have people look in? It's really the very opposite direction. It's not the effect that quantum mechanics might indeed have on the structure of general relativity or on the structure of space-time, but what effect general relativity might have on the structure of quantum mechanics. Now, the trouble here... <clears throat> is that people turn a blind eye to the real problem in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, as it exists at the moment, is a self-inconsistent theory. Now, most of the big physicists who complained about quantum mechanics, like Einstein and Schrodinger and 
in Dirac, surprisingly enough. Weren't so rude as I'm being. They say it's incomplete. Okay, that's a nicer way of saying it. Quantum mechanics is incomplete. It's not just that it's inconsistent. But Schrodinger was well aware of this. That's why he introduced his cat. I mean, he introduced this idea. You could imagine an experiment where you could put a cat into a state where it was dead and alive at the same time. Schrodinger was not saying, okay, well, we could make a, Schrod a cat which is dead and alive at the same time. Maybe somebody will do this one day. What he was saying is, look, this is ridiculous. And that's the point of view he was making. Einstein picked up on that view very much himself. Both of them held that same view. Also Dirac, rather surprisingly, he very rarely actually said what he really thought. You have to find the right place for the right quote. But you see, Dirac said, quantum mechanics is a provisional theory. And it's for this reason. You, the collapse of the, you see, let me put it in, in more direct terms. You see, the Schrodinger equation tells you how the quantum state evolves. The, there is a thing called the quantum state, is what in quantum mechanics, how you describe a system. There are lots of different ways of doing it, but you can do it Schrodinger's way. And it's like saying we've got a wave function. Okay, that's the quantum state. Now, Schrodinger's equation tells you how that quantum state evolves with time. It, there's this equation. It tells you d by dt blah, 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 equals something. Very clear thing. That state chugs along and does something. However, it doesn't, because when it gets too big or too something, something else happens. The wave function collapses. Usually you talk about making a measurement on the system. You say that the Schrodinger state only tells you the results of measurements. Well, the measurements. Well, you say you wheel out of the cupboard this measuring machine. This measuring machine measures something. There's a, there's a dial or a blip or a ping or something or other. It does something that you hear. It's measured it. Wheel it back into the cupboard and forget about it. That measuring device was made out of the same stuff of everything else. Why does it not evolve according to the Schrodinger equation? It doesn't say ping or not ping. It says ping and not ping at the same time. The Schrodinger's cat, dead and alive and not at the same time. That's what the Schrodinger equation tells you. Schrodinger, when he's describing his cat, he's saying, my equation is telling you a lot of nonsense. It's telling you that you can have cats which are dead and alive at the same time. Something else is involved in quantum mechanics. Now you see there are huge bodies of theorists, phys philosophers, physicists, goodness, what, all over the world having different views about how to get around this problem. Very few of them actually say you've got to change quantum mechanics. I'm one of those very few. Very few of those say you've got to change it because when you bring it, because it's bringing gravity into the picture. That's not, that's even still a minority within a minority. I'm part of that minority within a minority. I'm saying yes, it's when you bring gravity in, that's where you've got to change the theory. There's even a minority within the minority of that minority, which is which way <laughs> you do it. <laughs> but let's not go into that. But uh, I'm happy talking to my other minority friends who, who have views of this sort. But the view is that there is a conflict. And, and I, this is a, a serious, it's not just a view, it's a calculation. You can see there is a conflict between the two basic principles, one of general relativity and the other of quantum mechanics. The basic principle of quantum mechanics I'm talking about is the superposition principle. That's Dirac and his people chalk. You can have a particle here, a particle here, then it could be here and here at the same time. Any state, it could be one thing. If it could be that state, then you have states which involve both of them at once. That's the principle of superposition. Very fundamental to quantum mechanics. The principle that's fundamental to general relativity is Galileo's principle of equivalence. When I say Galileo, he described, you know, imagine you a big rock and a little rock dropping from the leaning tower of Pisa or whatever it might be. He knew if you had air resistance, it would make a difference. He says, yes, you have to get rid of the air resistance. He was well aware of that fact. When the air resistance is reduced to zero, they would drop together. We know that. If this astronaut drops a feather on a rock, I think, wasn't it? And they drop point like that. Sure, we know that happens. That's the principle underlying Einstein's general theory of relativity. What I'm saying is that those two principles are incompatible with each other. You could do a little calculation which shows 
that the two don't stand comfortably with each other. Something's got to go wrong. What it is that goes wrong, I don't know. It does give you a time scale for how long it takes to, for it to go wrong. This time scale was really the same as Deoshi, one of the people who have a, a theory of that quantum mechanics has to be modified by bring gravity. And this is Deoshi. He had a, an equation for how long it would take for the collapse to take place. I didn't know of his theory at that time. I produced the same formula. So sometimes people call it the Deoshi Penrose model. He, he actually was way before me, I think about five years or so, way before me. I didn't know his formula, but then we go off on somewhat different directions with regard to what you do with this formula. So, so that's an interesting issue. But the idea is that you can actually work out, if you have a body in a superposition of two places at once, how long would it take for it to become one or the other? And this equation tells you that. It's just that no experiment has actually reached that level as yet. So if that could occur, what's the implication of that, if that were true? That there's a period of time in which they would res it would resolve the superposition? Yes, a generalization or a, or a generalization of, yeah, a development of quantum mechanics in which the collapse of the wave function is a real phenomenon. I call this objective reduction. The collapse is sometimes more politely called reduction of the quantum state. Collapse of the wave function or redu reduction of the quantum state, the same thing. But then I like to use it, OR, objective state. Objective means uh, objective, O, R means reduction. OR says OR, it means one or the other. You don't get a superposition, but in a certain time scale, one or the other happens. Now that would be a physical process. That is a perfect transition because next in part three of Closer to Truth, three-part interview with Sir Roger Penrose, we discuss his unique approach to consciousness and the new physics, including quantum mechanics. You can watch more than 20 of Raj's videos on closertotruth.com and the Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Thank you, Roger. Thanks, everyone, for watching. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.